Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambo channel. David Schwartz, Ripple CTO, was asked, Is XRP susceptible to a 51% attack? as is the case with Bitcoin and other proof-of-work and proof-of-stake cryptocurrencies. Another topic I want to broach here, just the fun little thought experiments. Should cryptocurrency exchanges that, uh, that, that offer XRP, should they be required or expected to run their own XRP validators? Beyond that, I've got some non-XRP news, which is fun for you. Oh, this is a hot one, let me tell you this. This one is kind of mind-blowing to me. Uh, yesterday, I reported on the fact that uh, Tether printed 5 billion coins, 5 billion new little tether coins out there. Absolutely insane. And it had just happened, so I didn't have any news on it. Well, i got some news on it for you now, and I'll be covering that with you. Uh, it was an accident. Yes, 5 billion tether accidentally printed. <laughs> wow. And, uh, and then I also got something else kind of fun for you here. Maybe not so positive, but apparently uh, the majority of Bitcoin trading is a hoax. Apparently it's all wash trading, so I got an article for that. I'm going to share all of this and more for you on this video on the Moon Lambo channel. Before we get going here, though, if you would please gently tap that like button, and if you are a fan of Ripple and XRP, go ahead and subscribe. Do yourself a favor. You know what? Treat yourself today. Treat yourself today. This is a day off. It's Sunday. You deserve it. You deserve the Moon Lambo channel. And uh, let's get going here into the content now. Oh, I do want to start off real quick. The last video I made, uh, I kind of highlighted a video from this guy on Twitter, at Patty Stash. Just a real quick update here. Not going to delve into all the content of the last video, of course. Don't want to recreate that. But it had to do with uh, the, the altcoin season, which um, data shows is likely impending. And the, he, he did make this point, so I thought I'd just share it with you. Uh, he wanted to be clear, just in case there's misunderstanding. He was pulling uh, from, from data over the last six years. And so he's not promising a future, and, and nor was I, of course. You know, I'm always clear on that. But uh, he, he wanted to be clear: like, things can happen outside of expected parameters. He was only showing that if you if you do think that the past is an indicator of what's going to happen in the future, then we are on the verge of altcoin season here, which would be good for XRP, would it not? Anyway, let's move on here. So this piece here, and by the way, I have not read this yet. <laughs> I, uh, I I came across this right before I was going to record the video. I was like, oh, yeah, and I have to get to recording. So we're just going to experience this one together. But this is from ambcrypto.com, and this piece is titled, Tether Treasury Lands in Troubled Waters as it Accidentally Prints 5 Billion USDT, Followed by a Subsequent Burn. Wah, wah, wah. And the piece starts here. Tether Treasury minted a massive amount of Tether, and the news spread like wildfire. Tether, which has already speculated, was already speculated to carry out suspicious transaction, was questioned for printing 5 billion USDT, an amount large enough to shake things for Bitcoin. Yeah, no kidding, right? The CTO of Tether and Bitfinex, Paolo Ardoino, was quick to respond before this could be interpreted as manipulation. He informed the community that printing 5 billion USDT was a mistake and that they were intending to mint 50 million as a part of a swap for Omni to Tron Tether. Oh my god, so somebody's got some fat fingers and had a couple extra zeros there, did they not? Oh my god, okay, so their CTO said, this is a quote now from the, uh, the Tether C CTO. While preparing the issuance from Omni to Tron Swamp, there have been an issue with the token decimals. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Please check the burn transactions below. All right. Poloniex Exchange chimed and said that the minting took place when the exchange was conducting a USDT chain swap with the help of Tether. And here's, a, here's another quote here. An incorrect amount of USDT was accidentally minted, and this has since been resolved to the intended value. All right, and the piece continues. Thus, the Treasury decided to burn the minted 5 billion USDT and later printed uh, and later print the amount that was needed, 50 million USDT. Will Alert provided the details of the burn carried out by the Treasury in two sets of transactions. Below are the transaction details for the burn, and then you got it right here. I don't need to read through all that. Oh, I can't believe this, man. Did somebody get did somebody get fired here? <laughs> Not that I want somebody fired for this, but like somebody had to have gotten a slap on the wrist for this, right? Like this is this is kind of outrageous, and I of course it's in the news. Anyway, and then the piece ends here. This is a real short piece. That's the reason I was okay with reading it uh, on the fly with you. Here. But uh, Arduino justified the action by telling the community that since. Uh, they have to work with different tool chains across multiple blockchains. Issues happen, and they were happening, and uh, they were working towards preventing any such thing in the future. However, 
Even as the alert informed the community of Tether printing 50 million USDT, the price of Bitcoin was noted to be rising post the whole fiasco by 5.46% within a couple hours. Which is fine. I mean, okay, so there wasn't any sort of massive reaction, uh, crypto asset class-wide, or as far as it pertains to buying and selling of Bitcoin. But the whole theory is well, the more Tether gets printed, the, the higher the price of Bitcoin goes because there's more to just throw in it. So it's just artificially pumping up the price of Bitcoin. That's the, that's the concept of it anyway. A lot of people firmly believe that. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't expect this to make it make the price go down necessarily, but uh, it's interesting that how the uh, how all, all the speculators, all the traders responded to this, which is kind of like, eh, it's it fascinating nonetheless, but it <clears throat> didn't result in some crazy price action. Okay, I'm about to show you an image. I decided I'm not going to explain, I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to try and use words to explain this image I'm about to show for you. You're just going to have to see it yourself, interpret it the way you want to interpret it, and um, if you're driving, don't look at it now. Just revisit this, this video later. Keep curious. Keep your hands at 10 and 2 on the steering wheel. Be conscious of your fellow motorists out there. But here is the picture. This is from XRP Yoda. It has to do with Tether and Bitcoin, the effect on Bitcoin, as I just described. Womp, womp, wow. Make it rain. <laughs> look at that. Okay, I'm sorry. I saw this and I was just cracking up. Thank you, XRP Yoda. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Hopefully you didn't make somebody just swerve off the road right now. But yeah, <laughs> here we go. So I decided again, verbally not going to explain what's on the screen, but go ahead and just use your own eyes. It's uh, you'll have a you'll have a hearty chuckle. That's a good time right there. All right, uh, enough of that. Next piece here. This is from CNBC. This piece is titled. Majority of Bitcoin trading is a hoax, new study finds. And they got a few bullet points up here, so I'll read these because I'm not going to read this whole article to you. Um, 95% of spot Bitcoin trading volume is faked by unregulated exchanges, according to a study from Bitwise this week. The firm analyzed the top 81 crypto exchanges by volume on industry site coinmarketcap.com. The report uh, it aggregated, aggregated 6 billion in average daily Bitcoin volume. The study finds that only 273 million of that is legitimate. That's kind of staggering if accurate. Uh, third bullet point. People look at cryptocurrency and said this market is a mess. That's because they were looking at data that was manipulated, says Matthew Hugan, global head of research at Bitwise. That's that's crazy. So we're really talking about wash trading here, which is just you're creating an illusion. You're an entity that's buying and selling assets from yourself, making it look like it's going from one entity to another entity, whether it's an individual or an institution or whatever it may be. And that looks like makes it look like there's more legitimate volume, which can uh, spur interest in a particular asset. In this case, we're talking about Bitcoin. So that's wash trading in a nutshell for you. So the piece begins. New research is casting even more doubt on the legitimacy of Bitcoin trading. An analysis published by Bitwise this week shows that 95% of Bitcoin spot trading is faked by unregulated exchanges. The survey first reported by the Wall Street Journal echoes concerns by regulators that cryptocurrency markets are still ripe for manipulation. Bitwise, an asset manager in the process of trying to list the first ever Bitcoin exchange traded fund, ETF, uh, said it met with the Securities and Exchange Commission on Tuesday to discuss its application. As a part of the process, it submitted analysis that could help regulators cut through the noise. And here's a quote now. People looked at cryptocurrency and said this market is a mess. That's because they were looking at data that was manipulated, said Matthew Hugan, the global head of research at Bitwise. When you cut away the echo chamber of the, the these nonsense numbers... It should be an efficient, well-arbitraged market. Yeah, I believe that. That is, I do. Uh, you know, I, I always think about things in the sense of what does this mean for XRP? And I would guess that Bitcoin is not the only asset in which this is occurring. Um, through no fault of XRPs, if this is the case, and I, I have no reason to believe it wouldn't be if it's happening on, on you know, with Bitcoin, uh, you would think that similar manipulation would be occurring with, in terms of buying and selling XRP as well. And probably pretty much every other coin on the planet. And I wonder what's, what's it going to look like when you flush this activity out? Because from a regulatory perspective, uh, that could definitely put some some downward pressure in, uh, in terms of price. If this much trading volume is actually fake, um, it, it just begs the question, because to what degree is that affecting the market rate? Because liquidity is different than price, of course. What we're talking about here is if we're talking about wash trading, what that has to do is with the, the, the actual amount of liquidity, which is basically fake liquidity. To what degree would that affect the, affect the price? That's, that's kind of the unknown here at, the, at this point. Because, again, part of the reason behind this wash trading is, in theory, with this much more activity, there oh, a flurry of activity, and then uh, there could be some FOMO kicking in and more people end up buying assets. 
And so I, I'm not saying that there would be some tremendous crash if uh, you know once regulation is in place to prevent this this type of uh, this type of manipulation. But it does make me wonder: would there be some sort of correction, even if a small one? Just a thought. Uh, next piece here. This is uh, this is an, actually so I got two things from Quora for David Schwartz here. Ripple CTO. This one's short, and I just kind of chuckled because it was just such an obvious answer. And so there was a question on Quora. Somebody asked, "Can you cash in your Bitcoin for money?" David had this answer. The process of converting something into cash is technically referred to as selling in quotation marks. Selling, <laughs> and yes, you can sell your Bitcoin. And that's it. Pretty, pretty concise answer. I like it. It just got me chuckled. I was like, yeah, silly. <laughs> so anyway, here's, here's the one that I really wanted to share with you, though. Uh, this is another core one. And uh, Ripple CTO David Schwartz here, uh, awesome answer. And he was asked, is XRP susceptible to a 51% attack or takeover? And here's what wrote here. This is not too long, so I'm going to read through this whole thing. You, really, you just got to experience all the words from David Schwartz here. Uh, cryptocurrencies that are susceptible to 51% attacks are based on proof of work, POW, and proof of stake, POS, systems, because essentially anyone can accumulate 51% of power over the system through enough mining resources or staking power just by spending money. Uh, once an individual or entity has that majority control, they can rewrite history of the network, creating a scenario where you might rely on a transaction and then discover that the transaction was unconfirmed and a conflicting transaction accepted instead. Proof of work and proof of stake systems have no clear recovery path from hostile majority attacks. The XRP ledger, on the other hand, is not vulnerable to these attacks as it uses a distributed agreement system in which validation power is acquired through more democratic means. In order to reach such a high concentration of power, you would have to convince the other stakeholders in the network that you should hold the power. Fundamentally, there is no such thing as an unconfirmation in a distributed agreement system. That's a key difference, by the way, folks. Very key difference. That's why you there, there are no chain or reorganizations. This is me talking now. No chain organizations whatsoever within the XRP ledger. Net passable. But anyway, he continues here. Uh, there's no such thing as unconfirmation in a distributed agreement system. This reduces the harm that can be created by malfeasance and reduces the incentive to misbehave. We worry about mining collusion primarily because colluding miners can double spend and we can't easily make choices to decentralize mining power. Distributed agreement systems allow stakeholders to choose to use validators that reflect their values and the validators that are used and trusted can easily be changed. Therefore, even in the unlikely scenario that stakeholders within the network choose to grant significant power to a single entity, if that participant proved to be a bad actor, the stakeholders would simply stop using their validators, effectively stripping them of that power. This is why, guys, this is why the XRP, the technology that is the XRP ledger is superior to proof of work and superior to proof of stake. And to quote Ripple employee Ryan Zagone, proof of work doesn't work. Proof of work doesn't work. He said it twice. <laughs> right. And uh, anyway, so then uh, David Schwartz wraps it up by stating, the beauty of the system is that stakeholders, whether it be power users, exchanges, investors, companies that build on the ledger, etc., can each use the network how they see fit, as opposed to pressuring other participants to get the behavior they want. If stakeholders are concerned about transaction discrimination, they can pick validators that, uh, that won't censor. If they don't want geographic centralization, they can pick validators that are spread across the globe. They can simply choose their destiny directly or even run validators themselves to have a role in how the network makes forward progress. Exactly. And that's why all this is absolutely superior technology. And you know, another thing that is, is well worth noting, even though it wasn't um, mentioned by David in this particular response here, is that you know, the worst you can do, because what does an attack on the XRP ledger look like? It's really, even if you succeed in quote, quotation marks, like what have you really accomplished? Because all you're doing is uh, temporarily halting forward progression, which is, is what you want, though, because if a network is under attack, the, the last thing you'd want is forward progression because there, there could be, like he said, if there's malfeasance, uh, what's, what's being written there? So, you know, what's being written to the ledger in the case of XRP or to the blockchain in, in terms of uh, uh, Bitcoin, you know? But, uh, anyway, that, that's my two cents on anyway. Uh, now, here's a tweet. This is Nick Bugaus. He's a Rickle, Ripple employee. And it was actually in response to something that Tiffany Hayden tweeted out. So maybe I'll read Tiffany's first, actually, here. They're both on the same topic here. It's about the concept of uh, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges 
uh, should they run their own validators? And I'll, I'm going to read through Tiffany's uh, tweet here, and then Nick's, and then I'm going to share you with my personal opinion on this. All right, hashtag XRP community. This is from Tiffany. How can we apply pressure to exchanges to get them to run their own validators? If businesses with paying customers are using the XRP ledger, why are they forcing non-paid validators to carry them? It's becoming parasitic. And then she uh, she uh, tagged on Twitter here, Bitstamp, Kraken, and BitBank Incorporated. All right. And then here's Nick's, uh, Nick's tweet. And again, Nick Mukubugal, still not sure if I'm saying his last name correct. <laughs> I need to hear it pronounced. Somebody please help me. And uh, so he tweeted out in response to this. He seems to share a pretty similar opinion. He tweeted out, I strongly believe that every exchange that makes XRP available owes it to their customers and the broader ecosystem to operate its own infrastructure, including committing to run a validator as a mission-critical service with the goal of making as reliable as possible. Okay, uh, these are respectable opinions. I want to be real clear at the outset because I do have a a little bit of a different take on this. Uh, I I get completely respect Tiffany Hayden, completely respect Nick, and I respect their opinions on this, although I do feel differently on this particular topic. I don't want to... I don't want to shame anybody into running a validator. Um, and, and that's what happened. Like, if, if there's some sort of actual movement here, that, that could potentially be what be what happens. And if these, these uh, entities don't feel that they need to run a validator today, they don't feel like they care enough about the network, I want the, I want the public at large to know that. If these, if the, if the, seriously, if these, these cryptocurrency exchanges are not running um, validators, and that's something that's important to, if it's something that's important to me or you as an XRP holder, uh, somebody that actually does care about the network. If that's something that's important to you, maybe you take your business elsewhere. I just I mean, what I'm saying is I want it to be clear to what degree some somebody actually cares about this. And and then on, on the front of um, are they taking advantage of the network by by not running their own validators? Um, well, okay. Point taken that they're using the resources of others to 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 make these transactions possible. That's true. Um, the reason that I wouldn't go quite so far as to call them a parasite. Uh, is is simply because if you are running a validator, you understand that many, many other individuals and entities are going to be able to take advantage of the fact that you're doing that, and you're doing that in good faith because you do care about the network. And so, um, for instance, me, me utilizing the XRP ledger when I buy and sell, am I a parasite? Or or is it only the case that you're a parasite if you're using the XRP ledger um, and you're not running a validator if you reach a certain size? And if it is the case that you have to reach a certain size, what is that threshold? Is it if your entity has one person, two people, 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people? Like, what's the threshold? So the devil's always in the details with stuff like this to me. And so, again, to completely respect their opinions, I don't think that they're unreasonable whatsoever. I just don't feel the same. I, I, I just look at it a little bit differently on that. And so as far as pressuring them, eh, I just, I, I just think, because again, you can't force them to care. It, it, it's just, and, and to what degree would this positively affect the ecosystem? Okay, more more validators in theory better, but um, t- to what degree? I mean, you could argue maybe it makes it a little bit more decentralized geographically. Okay, that's that's a fair, that would be a fair point also. Seriously, it is. But is that more important than being able to identify those people who actually give a fly and you know what about the network? So it really depends on what you're looking for. I like transparency because I feel like this is a better way for me to see who actually cares. So um, it's not like you're terribly wrong, which, whether you side with me or you side with Nick and Tiffany. Whatever you feel, I just I, it's not. I, you know, I don't think you're horrendously wrong either way. Like you really can't be. It just comes to a matter of preference, and I'm just sharing with, with you what my my personal preference is on that. But feel feel free to let me know what you think. If you disagree with me, that's perfectly fine. I always respect opinions that are different than mine. That's that's fine. Um, next piece here. This was from Neil Duncan, and I'm going to to link this below. I watched this video this morning, and it's pretty cool. It's he he, he put this together, and it was um there's there's um clip from at least one clip of Jerome Powell, Fed chairman. And um, he was asked about the potential for cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, re- replacing basically United States dollars, the global rec- cur- reserve currency. And he, and he stated, uh, well, you know, something like that could happen, but currently we're not on the right track for that. And, you, you know, I'm paraphrasing there and you can hear exactly what he says. But then uh, the question was posed via this video in text, um, you know, because the co- actually it was posed also specifically to Jerome Powell. Um, is there anything, anything else out there beyond Bitcoin? What else that you could do it? And he cited stable coins, but he said those are closed networks. And then the, on the screen, it flashed something some along the lines of what about XRP? Uh, you know, what, what could that do it? And in terms of, of that, you know, the way I the way I look at it personally is 
XRP, you know, there, I'm not going to say that XRP or any coin, wh- whether they will or won't become a reserve currency. I think something certainly can. And big picture, I, 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 I'm not 100% confident that for the rest of time, for the rest of time, certainly not, that the, the U- United States dollar is going to be the global reserve currency, for better or worse, for whatever. I mean, it depends on where you are and whether or not they think that's good or bad. But uh, I, I, I think that it's reasonable to presume that it is possible for one or more cryptocurrencies to, to fill that role for a number of reasons. And I don't need, I've talked about that recently, so I'm not going to get into the, the reasoning for that exactly. But, um, but anyway, the, the question is posed, so what about XRP? And so on that front, I think, well, it's becoming a pool of liquidity. And as technology is built out, uh, there needs to be additional infrastructure. If it's going to actually take the place of uh, the United States dollar in terms of global re- reserve currency, uh, th- since it is decentralized, anything that's decentralized, I think, has a, has a shot at actually achieving this. But it's got to have staying power. And I think with the, uh, the utility of XRP, uh, I, 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 it's just my firm opinion, it's going to be here for decades. I, I really do think that. And I think that um, the, the value and price are going to align at some point. Value and price are two different things. When I think value, it's more about the actual utility, the usage of it. When I say price, that's just the market rate, really. And those two things are not currently aligned, but I suspect that they will be at some point in the future. And as more enter the, the ecosystem, it's kind of a moving target on what that is, what that blend is, but it's going to increase, I believe. that That's my stance. Anyway, so I'm going to link this below. You should definitely check this out. And it's got a little clip at the end of this of that what I was talking about, uh, Ryan Zagone. He's uh, and he was on. It was like a I can't remember if it's called the Faster Payments Task Force or something like that. But um, he was on some sort of committee with Fed Chairman Jerome Powell. So uh, even though Jerome Powell has not said anything about XRP ever, as far as I know, he has to be pretty well versed. How can he not? That's why the question here, you know, is how much does Jerome Powell know about Ripple and XRP? Uh, you know something, and, and I'm sure that Ryan Zagone has directly had conversations with them. They're on the same freaking committee, like, or at least they were. I can't remember if it's been disbanded bandit at this point, but uh, that, that's where I'm with that. Uh, next piece here, this is kind of interesting, just kind of fun, so I thought I'd share it with you. I, uh, I reported in a previous video that Wells Fargo, they tweeted uh, out their confirmation that Wells Fargo does not allow uh, transactions involving cryptocurrency. So Rand Nooner, host of CNBC Crypto Trader, he tweeted this out with a picture which I will describe in a moment. Dear at Wells Fargo, I know I just moved to uh, United States of America and opened an account with you. I read this yesterday and I can't bank with a bank that tells me what I can and can't do with my money. And here's the picture that he uploaded. And it's a picture of his credit card cut in half, his Wells Fargo credit card. Um, I don't blame him. Look, I... It's, Seriously, if, if that's your stance, I completely respect that. And uh, some people did comment on my video when I reported that, that there was a difference between being able to purchase cryptocurrencies, whether it's with uh, your checking account versus your credit card. So there could be a difference there. Nonetheless, there's some sort of control going on there, which is not cool in my book. So anyway, that, that's all I know on the subject and thought I'd share it with you. Uh, now, here's a fun tweet from Anthony Pompliano from earlier this morning. Gold market cap, $7.8 trillion dollars. Bitcoin market cap, $200 billion. Gold's market cap is 39 times larger than Bitcoin. It won't happen overnight, but Bitcoin is slowly catching up. And so, uh, yes, it's going to keep... You know what? I like to look at it more in terms of the entire asset class because there's going to be certain coins that have staying power. And, of course, you're going to get into a trillion-dollar market cap and then multi-trillion-dollar market cap. And that's why when I look at utility, I'm so confident in XRP. As for Bitcoin, maybe it'll have staying power as a store of wealth. I'm still not 100% convinced one way or another on that because without additional utility, if you want something that you can have more confidence in, if there's a coin like XRP, if I'm right, and that has staying power, why wouldn't you put your money in that um, is as a store of wealth because the more utility a coin has the more confident one can be that it has staying power is not is that not logical that's how i look at it so we'll see maybe bitcoin just because it's the 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 you know it's the uh og it's been around the longest maybe i'm still skeptical of that but who knows and the things can change uh you know if lightning network is adopted even though it's a centralized solution if people actually use it that could be a factor uh, of course lightning network works uh on most blockchains but that's a different different conversation entirely and um, finally, I just want to share this with you here. This was a tweet from Crypto Bitlord, and it states, If you look at Bitcoin since 2011, the parabolic moves were impossible to chart. Noobs that sold thinking it was over only sold to buy back higher. This time, it won't be any different. And conceptually, I think he's correct. And that's why when I look at all the panic, buying and selling, I just keep looking at these these cycles and how it's everybody think it's, thinks it's the world when you see these massive uh, decreases in price and people panic. 
And I, I, I was through a major cycle myself um, because just because of the nature of when I jumped into crypto, it was a crazy time to jump in November 2017. And that run up all the way to 800 and something billion in, in market cap and Bitcoin hitting almost 20,000 and XRP hitting almost four bucks, all that good stuff. And then I got to see all the despair over the course of 2018 with Bitcoin getting as low as... Um, what did it get down to? 3100 something like that. And XRP got as low as about $0.25. Cents. And, oh my God, despair. And pe- there were people that got out of crypto thinking that legitimately was the end. And now, what do we see? Those lows. Look at those lows. Uh, of 3100 and XRP at $0.25. Cents, and you saw Bitcoin go up to, recently, up to 14000 from 3100 You saw XRP get all the way up to um, over $0.50 cents fairly recently. And I saw it as low, just from memory here, as low as $0.25. Cents. And so now you're seeing it dip below again, and both are a little bit lower to whatever degree. It, does, it doesn't matter. But just understand conceptually, conceptually what I'm getting at here. And what are people saying again? It's the end of the world. Well, both XRP and Bitcoin are still up, and we're probably on the verge of altcoin season. Well, we might be anyway. We'll see. But uh, again, people, the way that they emotionally buy and sell, it's the end of the world again. And these are just two examples of these emotional cycles humans keep putting themselves through. And they've been doing it for, uh, you, you could date back for almost a decade, you know, or about, yeah, about for whenever the first cryptocurrency exchange came out in particular. Uh, humans are going to keep behaving like this until this is all sorted out, which is going to take a long, long time. And then there's some level of certainty under which coins have staying power. But by the time that happens, there's going to be less of an opportunity for the multiplier effect, which is why I'm happy to put my money in and um, engage in this high risk investment. But it's a calculated risk. It's not something like gambling, all willy-nilly throwing money in. It's a calculated high-risk investment. And um, it's fun to follow. It's fun to follow. That's, that's, that's part of the reason I'm here, too. It's fun to have skin in the game. So uh, anyway, that's all I got for you in this particular video. Thank you so much for watching. I am not a financial advisor. Do not buy or sell anything because of anything that I say are right. That would be a very, very, very bad idea.